Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Please be seated. What is your life centered on? What is your life oriented around? A question I want you to think and ponder as we go throughout our meditation on the scriptures today. Anything worth doing requires some sacrifice. The freedoms you enjoy were not free, but came at a cost. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Perhaps you've heard some or maybe all of these phrases. I find them kind of timely as we have the Olympics coming around the corner. And at the Olympics, you always hear sacrificial kind of statements from the athletes when they're interviewed. We may not normally think of them in those terms, but that's really what they talk about. Because when all of their friends are going out for a beer or a night on the town or going to a baseball game, they're training. They're running, they're lifting weights, they're swimming in the pool, they're skipping out on all that fun stuff in order to train because they have a goal to be the best in the world. And in pursuit of that goal, it orients the focus of all the other aspects of their life, the sacrifices they make. Well, you are the same. You have something your life is centered on, something that drags all the other aspects of your life into its orbit, just like for the athlete skipping out on the beer or going to the restaurant or hanging out with their friends to train. You have something like that in your life as well. Well, today in our Old Testament reading and our Gospel reading, we learn a little bit about sacrifice. If we read and listen, humans seem to have an intrinsic understanding of the concept of sacrifice in pursuit of a larger goal. Yet often, if we're being honest, don't we sort of wish we could have our cake and eat it too when it comes to our faith? We'd love to be able to share the message of Jesus without any sacrifice. But our lessons from Scripture today say that that's not the way it works. So let's start with our Old Testament reading in the prophet Amos. So just to give you a little background on Amos, when Amos is called to be a prophet, the kingdom of Israel, and the, like the normal kingdom of Israel you would think of in the Old Testament, is divided into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom, which still retains the name Israel, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And during the time of Amos, Israel, the larger and more prosperous of the two kingdoms, is ruled by Jeroboam II. And by every worldly measure, Jeroboam II is a prosperous and successful king. He's restoring a lot of the prestige of the nation of Israel. He's, he's reestablishing the boundaries of their kingdom, and on and on and on. But there's one problem. Jeroboam is not a faithful king. Under his rule, they have followed the worship of many other gods and no longer the true God. And so Amos is called by God, right? He mentions that in the reading we heard today, that he was a herdsman, a dresser of sycamore figs. He wasn't a prophet or a prophet's son. But the Lord calls him to speak to his people Israel. So Amos has an exchange with God at the beginning of our reading, verses 8 and 9, and I'll read it again. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel, and I will never again pass by them. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. So your first thought when you read that is probably, what the heck's a plumb line? I know that was mine the first time I read that. Or the second thought that I had is when you're at the seminary, you hate words like that because they show up one time in all of the scriptures. And you're, you just got to, when you're translating from Hebrew or Greek, you're just pouring through tons of books trying to find what, what word this is. But as I explained to the kids, the plumb line is a very valuable tool. It's a simple tool 
but it serves a valuable purpose. When someone is building a house or a structure, they find a place to hang the plumb line so that it is a reference point for all of the vertical parts of the structure to make sure that it's aligned through the force of gravity to the ground that it's going to be on. Without that reference, the structure will not be sound. It won't be able to withstand pressures from nature and from the people who live in it. So that's a plumb line. It's a simple tool that orients the entire structure around it. A guiding line, if you will. And God says that he's going to set his own plumb line among his people to recenter them in reference to him. Because God doesn't care that Israel has a great army or that they're thriving economically because they have gone after other gods. They're no longer tied to their salvation. So how is he going to do that? Well, it doesn't sound pleasant, does it? Let me read that part again. So he says he's going to set a plumb line in the midst of his people. The high places of Isaac, high places is always a reference to temples, which are usually put up on mountains. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste, and I will rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Sacrifice is going to come in the midst of this recentering, and not just for the people of Israel, but for the prophet that God is sending. So God goes through all this stuff, and then he basically says, All right, Amos, I want you to go tell that to the most powerful man in the kingdom. What would your reaction be? It's sort of like the equivalent of of somebody, of God giving a message to you about the inevitable destruction of the United States and then tells you to publicly preach that to the president. Probably a little fear and trembling, a little worry. Because you're talking to the king here. And even the specific words in the thing that you're going to say to them is basically saying, yeah, God's going to kill you, actually. So Amos is probably saying, "Uh, you want me to say what to the king? Not a welcome message. And even later on in the story, after he has prophesied, Amaziah, the high priest... In Bethel, where the king resides, he gives Amos, well, he chastises Amos. He tells the king that Amos is conspiring against you. And then he gives Amos an opportunity to avoid the difficult task that God has called him to and go somewhere where he'll be comfortable. So he says here in verse 12, And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. In other words, go to Judah. You'll be comfortable. They will appreciate what you have to say. But never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. We face that same choice often too, don't we? There's always a comfortable, safe alternative when God calls us to do something difficult. When God calls us to share his word, to tell people about him, despite some risk of rejection, despite some risk of harm to ourselves. So what does Amos do in response to this veiled threat This temptation of comfort. Amos basically says, God told me to prophesy to his people, so that's what I'm doing. Right? He says, Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. And the very next verse, which wasn't in our reading today, says, Therefore, here is what the Lord declares. And then he does what God asks him to do. Now let's jump to our gospel reading for Mark chapter 6, 
This recounts Herod's recollection of the ultimate penalty sacrifice that John the Baptist paid in answering the call from God to prepare the way for the Savior to preach repentance of sin according to God's law. He too spoke out against a powerful man in the land, King Herod. King Herod had married his brother's wife while his brother was still living. And John spoke out against it and said, it's not lawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. And the brother's wife, Herodias, wasn't too happy that there was a guy going around accusing her of adultery. And so she sought and plotted to kill John. You know, the rest of the story, her daughter comes in and dances, and despite the fact that Herod has a sort of strange respect for John, and he's sort of curious about what he has to say, he gets trapped by his own words, and Herodias gets her wish. John the Baptist is killed. And if our lesson stopped there, perhaps you might think, well, what is God doing He's just sending all of these people to make these sacrifices for him. What's he going to do? And maybe sometimes you find yourself having that same thought when he calls you to do something that involves some risk and difficulty. Why me? Who am I that he's asking to do this? Where's he at? Why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't the Holy Spirit intervene? But the lesson doesn't stop there. Because John was the last of the Old Testament styled prophets. And his job was to prepare the way for someone greater. In his own words, someone whose sandals he's not worthy to untie. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the answer to that question in your mind. What's God going to do? It's something he's already done and continues to do in your life. And to use the image from our Old Testament reading in Amos, Jesus is the plumb line that was prophesied to set in the midst of God's people to reorient them around God, reorient them around the Savior, to right our relationship with him. And Jesus knows a thing or two about sacrifice. We don't have a God that calls us to sacrifice on behalf of the right speaking and preaching of God's word for no reason. The reason is no less than the salvation of those to whom he sends you. Amos and John the Baptist knew this. They obeyed God despite knowing the risk of speaking against the kings they were sent to. Because their reward was greater than the risk, and they believed God's desire was to restore his people. That the very reason he was sending them was their own salvation. God promised to set a plumb line in order to restore the righteousness of his people, and so he did that in Jesus God required no greater sacrifice than the one he undertook himself in Jesus on the cross. The plumb line of Jesus centers correcting and recentering of God's people and eventually the whole of the created universe. The plumb line of Jesus recenters your whole life as well. See, once you come to faith in Christ, there's nothing else that can take that spot of orienting all of your being. Just like the athlete who foregoes the pleasures of this life in order to train for the greater goal of notoriety and success and excelling at their craft. So to those who come to faith in Christ now know why they are given to sacrifice and risk. For their reward, your reward, is far greater than any suffering you are called to endure. And not only that... But because of the gracious gospel of Jesus, that plumb line has been made yours in baptism. He's called you according to his purpose in his word so that you know that when he sends you, 
Your salvation is secure in Christ, so you have nothing to fear. And you're motivated by love because the purpose for which he sends you is so that they too can come to know Jesus and have their relationship with God restored. The sacrifice of the Son of God himself was done for this very purpose. And the victory he has over death in the grave means that whatever the world throws at you, even if it gets as bad as John the Baptist, you have nothing to fear. For even death has been defeated in Jesus. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I, we are the new called and sent, just like Amos and John. Now we may not be official prophets sent to speak against worldly kings, but we have been called to speak the truth of Jesus in a world that's crooked and crumbling around the wrong reference lines. They need Jesus, just like you and I did. And so God sends you and me so that they have a chance to hear his word and receive the grace of God in Jesus. It will require sacrifice. It will require risk. But in those moments when your fear threatens to overwhelm, you remember the two reasons why Amos and John the Baptist didn't falter or disobey God or take that comfortable alternative. They didn't do that because they knew their reward and the salvation of their soul was far greater than any suffering they might endure. And perhaps more importantly, they knew that the reason they were being sent was no less than to bring about the salvation of those they're sent to by them hearing God's word through your mouth. And often we think of death as the ultimate sacrifice. We say that a lot, right? So John paid the ultimate sacrifice for teaching truthfully about God's law. But that's not really the ultimate sacrifice, is it? The ultimate sacrifice was the sacrifice Jesus took on your behalf and mine on the cross. Not just an earthly death, but an eternal death and separation from God so that you and I no longer have to endure that. And even that was overcome in Jesus. Dear friends in Christ, you have nothing to fear in this life. For Jesus goes with you wherever you go. You're armed by his word and your salvation is secure. So go forth bearing the message of love that's no less than the plumb line for the entire universe to help others get that same recentering that you and I have been blessed to receive through the grace of God and Jesus Christ. And I'll close, I think, with Amos's words because I just sort of love his matter-of-fact response to the temptation to give up God's call. I was no prophet nor a prophet's son, but I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs. But the Lord, Yahweh, took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. God grant you and I such faith in the promises of Jesus as we go out and speak as the Lord commands us to do. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus in the midst of of the risk and the sacrifice that he calls you to until he comes again in glory to make everything new. Amen. Please rise.